Hey, kiddos, how you doing? Man, it's so good to be back with you to continue our reading of, uh, what? The Chaplains and Clergy of the Revolution with J.T. Headley, who compiled all of these different uh, stories of these great pastors and chaplains, these clergy. And when did he do that? Yeah, that's right. He put it together in 1874. And we're going to get into chapter 30 here very shortly. The amazing thing to me is that um, I, I, I have to be honest with you. I don't know that my reading skills are going to be any better today than what they have been. But I did go and pre-read this chapter, chapter 30, and all the way through chapter 33. And I don't know if it's going to do to you what it did to me is that as I get through this, I end up having tears. And my tears are for the pastors that are out there today that have no understanding of these truths and what the pastors and the importance of the pastors and the extensibility of the gospel, which I always talk about. So with that, I want to get us going here into chapter 30 with Israel Evans. And here's what this chapter is about. His character, ordained chaplain in the army, remains with the New Hampshire Brigade through the war, stands besides Washington at Yorktown, antidote of him and Washington, his sermon on the field of battle, settled at Concord, New Hampshire, and then his death. The next three chapters are kind of long chapters, but they're, they're heart-wrenching, heart-wrenching. So if you'll join with me. There's perhaps no chaplain of the revolution who followed its fortune so steadily from its commencement to its close, sharing all its perils and its hardships, yet about whom so little is known as the subject of this sketch. He was a native of Pennsylvania, and at the commencement of the struggle between the colonies and Great Britain was a warm, uncompromising patriot. Having chosen his profession before the breaking out of hostilities, he did not consider it his duty to relinquish it, though from what is known of his character, there is but little doubt that, had he been an ordinary citizen, he would have entered the army as a soldier. He was by nature better fitted for the stern duties of a military life, its strict subordination and exact method, and for the battlefield, then for the quiet routine of a pastor's calling. Humility was not a prominent trait in his character, and uh, the exactitude and unbending rules of his military experience did not tend to make him yielding and tractable. When the war commenced, he offered himself as a chaplain to the army and was ordained as such in 1776 in Philadelphia at the age of 29. From 1777 to the close of the war, he was attached the whole time to the New Hampshire Brigade. Of the fierce battles he witnessed, the long marches he made, and want and privation he endured, he apparently kept no record. And hence, the incidents and details of this most interesting portion of his life are forever lost to posterity. We catch a glimpse of him in the fierce conflicts at Saratoga. Hear his voice as he addresses the Western Army after their return from the expedition against the Indians. Sympathize with him as he pours his sad lament over the body of his dead commander, General Poor, at Hackensack. But all between has been swept by the wave of, of oblivion. He not only shared the sufferings of the army at Valley Forge, but was of great service in encouraging and cheering the soldiers 
when ready to yield to despair. His impenetrable coolness in battle was proverbial, and he rather sought than shunned the post of danger. At the Battle of Yorktown, he was standing besides Washington when a cannonball in full sweep struck the earth at his very feet and sent a shower of dirt over his hat. Washington glanced at the chaplain to see how he took it, but the latter was an impetrable as himself. Without stirring from the spot, he took off his hat and seeing it covered with sand, said quietly as he held it up, See, General? Washington smiled and replied, Mr. Evans, you had better take that home and show it to your wife and children. The chaplain smiled in return and, replacing it on his head, turned his attention once more to the cannonade that was shaking the field like an earthquake. After the surrender of Cornwallis, he preached a sermon in the open air to the assembled brigade, taking the 115th Psalm for his text, beginning, quote, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where now is their God? But our God is in heavens. He hath done whatever so he pleased. End quote. After tracing the hand of God from the commencement of the struggle through all the changing fortunes that followed, he burst into thanksgiving for the glorious victory they had just achieved and exclaims, quote, For these and innumerable instances of public mercy, we desire most heartily to praise God and to say, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us the wisdom of our counselors, though their counsels and wisdom have surpassed our most sanguine expectations. Not unto us our commanders and armies, though they have behaved themselves so valiantly and conducted wisely. Yet give glory not unto them, but unto the name of God, for he it was who taught our senators wisdom and girded our soldiers with courage and strength. It is the Lord our God who has fought for us in every successful battle and has hitherto supported our righteous cause against those who hate us without any just reason. Surely we may say, O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvelous things, his right hand and his holy arm, hath gotten him the victory. The Lord hath made known his salvation. His righteousness had he openly showed in the sight of our enemies. He hath remembered his mercy toward us. All the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. End quote. He thanks God for the aid of the French, for giving us good men in Congress, and then exclaims, quote, Oh, give thanks to the Lord our God for our brave general, the commander-in-chief of all our armies, a general possessed of such unparalleled fortitude and patience, and not more patient than meek and virtuous and humane. And if I may be permitted to say anything of a character which so much outshines the brightest ecunim that writes can offer, that writers can offer. I will venture to say that if you search for faults in the conduct of that true patriot and most excellent hero, you will find none unless you call it a fault to exercise compassion and lenity toward those negligent and guilty offenders who, by their sloth and inattention to the best orders, counteracted the wisest plans and frustrated the best schemes of military discipline and policy. Methinks I see the illustrious Washington, 
with but two or three thousand men retreating indeed before ten or twelve thousand of the enemy, but checking their progress through the country. And when reinforced by the brave militia, turning upon the enemy, killing some and capturing many, and confining them during the whole winter within narrow bounds. Oh, Americans, give glory to God for such a faithful hero. Then you saw him, greatest when most without your aid, collected himself, he greatly resolved with his few faithful followers to be the barrier of liberty or fall in its defense. End quote. He then speaks of Saratoga, describes Arnold as a thunderbolt on the day, and winds up by referring to the coming winter, which may demand great sacrifices, and exhorts them not to be startled by anticipated sufferings, but bear all like men, and to refrain from profane swearing and all ungodly acts, and live the lives of true Christians. It was a thrilling spectacle that war one chaplain standing on the bloody field of Yorktown, the wreck of the fight strewn all around him, and lifting his pains of praise to Washington and his shout of thanksgiving to God. The excited soldiers, fresh from the field of their fame and elated with their great victory, could scarcely refrain from sending up their thrilling huzzas when the eloquent chaplain, passing from his review of the troubled past, burst forth into an eulogium of their gallant leader. He published several of his sermons after the war, all of which exhibit his stern and unyielding patriotism. In 1789, he was ordained pastor of the church in Concord, to which he became known as his connection with the New Hampshire Brigade. His military career did not tend to make him the most conciliating of pastors, and in 1797 he resigned his charge, though he continued to reside in the place till his death in March 1807 in the 60th year of his age. Oh, amazing. I mean, this guy went to war as a chaplain and did all of those duties as a chaplain and more when he was 29 years old. And how about that? A cannon. Can you imagine a cannonball smashing it right there at the front of your feet? And he looks at the dirt on his hat and holds it up to General Washington and they have that exchange. Wow. Totally, totally amazing to me. Uh, about this great man and uh, Israel Evans. Ah, Mr. Evans. Well, with that, we'll get ready for chapter 31 with Cotton Mather Smith. And this is a long chapter. So I will take and we'll come back in a few. <laughs>